This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hi, guys. You know that genetics plays a huge role in our health, and more people are using genetic testing to determine risk for diseases like cancer for themselves and their kids than ever before. So I want to tell you about ORCID. It's the only company that does whole genome testing for embryos, testing before your child is born. If you're doing IVF, this is a clear choice now because now you can reduce risk for thousands of single gene disorders, including heritable forms of autism, pediatric cancers, and birth defects. Check them out at orchidhealth.com. Hey, everybody. This is Razib with the Unsupervised Learning Podcast, and I am here today with Chris Rufo, who, uh, like unlike some of my guests, probably does not need much of an introduction. But, uh, you know, I will uh, introduce Chris Rufo a little bit. Um, he has a book out, uh, which is what we're going to mostly be talking about, America's Cultural Revolution. I think the title is pretty straightforward, but uh, some of the details uh, within the book might not be as straightforward to some of you out there. So hopefully uh, there will be some knowledge being thrown down. Uh, Chris was also a filmmaker uh, many, many years ago, um, or maybe not that many years ago, but in the scale of his life, probably. Um, and he has also been an activist. And over the last three years, he's really blown up, uh, become a figure, so to speak, um, whether you think it's positive or negative, uh, you know, Chris has made a difference in the world. I got to say that. And I will say, um, I think, Chris, like, we first encountered each other in the spring of 2020. Uh, you're just some obscure guy um, dropping into my DMs, asking what was going on. And uh, <laughs> you know, now here you are. So you never know uh, when you rub up against greatness, right? So, um, yeah, Chris, um, I actually want to ask you really quickly before we start. You were a filmmaker. Um, you know, you're the son of attorneys. Um, you know, uh, and now you're doing this. Okay, it's a, it's a big difference. So you're you're you have a creative, artistic side, um, and I don't think people think of that all the time. Um, why did you want to go into film? Yeah, I think you know, looking back and having the benefit of hindsight, I wanted to go into film after college, really to get out into the world, to travel. Um, and and I think you know, looking back, it's quite possible that I I, I was not. Uh, ideally suited to be a film director, but but was uh, uh, was seeing it more as a vehicle for seeing the world. And so in that sense, it was very successful. Um, I got a chance to travel all over the world and spend, you know, a number of years abroad and uh, meet interesting people, get out into the field, like really um, see things from a perspective um, that has been, I think, really beneficial to me now that I've changed over into a new career and uh, and turned to more towards politics, towards writing, towards this activism um, and other efforts. Well, so you went to Xinjiang, right? Yes. Hey, can you talk about that really quickly? Because that's like yeah, sp- out, of, out of, you know, the north. Out of pocket. Yeah. Yeah. I, I One of the films that I did, I spent a year in Xinjiang province, China. So this is the, you know, very famous uh, Uyghur majority province. Um, I did a documentary there about uh, Uyghurs and Han Chinese, told through the story of this uh, uh, baseball team, which was kind of a novelty. And um, it was really an amazing experience. I got to understand Chinese politics and culture. Um, I got to understand uh, Uyghur, Uyghur politics and culture and history. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's about as far away as you can get. Uh, you know, it, it, and traveling all through the province and, and to the small villages and towns. And so that was a, you know, kind of an interesting experience. It's formative in one way for me personally, but in another way, it's kind of low utility. Uh, you know, th- th- there's there's not really much uh, to do or to, or, or to say or to, there's not really much market for knowledge about the Uyghurs, um, unfortunately. Well, there wasn't. Um, but there wasn't. you think that there is? I, that'd, be a, that'd be a good question. I don't know. Well, I mean, I would think... Um... You know, I think part of the issue is this is obviously not part of the you know, and we'll, we'll get to the book obviously, but yeah, uh, you know, over the last five to ten years, I think we've seen a, a change in the American elite in terms of what China is going to be from Chimerica to great power competition, and so yeah. you know, during the you know, you're, I'm a little older than you, but during the um, 
during the Cold War, there was like a whole you know field of Russian studies and Sovietologists. They knew all sorts of obscure things about. Yeah. Let's just call it the great enemy, you know. And so, if China's going to be the great enemy, um, we got to know all about it. And so, I do think that um, having obscure ethnographic knowledge is probably going to be relevant. I mean, who? I mean, you know, who cares that like people in, you know, Guangdong speak a different dialect than people in Shanghai? Well, you know what? It might be relevant. It might be relevant now. Yeah. You know, all yeah. these sorts of like little things. You never know what kind of information is going to be relevant. You know. True. I think. Um, I think one thing that people need to realize is, you know, we over optimize sometimes in terms of professional and intellectual um, studies. And, you know, I mean, just like looking at your background, it's a little bit peripatetic, frankly, you know, like you've gone from thing to thing, but look where you are now. And um, maybe you wouldn't be here if you hadn't sampled, uh, you know, different, you know, just kind of like things in life you know like maybe you would be a cpa somewhere maybe i mean maybe the chris Rifo, who's a cpa would be uh you know living on mercer island and doing very well for himself maybe when ma making a, a difference in the world you know, you know what i'm trying to say yeah no absolutely yeah i think that it's one of those things i think is quite interesting you look back at your you're, you're living your life in the present and sometimes the answers are, aren't always there and then you look back at your life and some of those experiences or desires or um uh, you know directions that didn't make sense at the time start to cohere into something and so um you know i think yeah you get a little bit older you, you spend your 20s you know experimenting pushing working you know failing uh succeeding you know fighting i mean uh, there's there's all sorts of drama in that stage of life and i think that um you know now that it's started to stabilize i, I just turned 39 uh you know a couple of days ago and uh starting to stabilize and starting to make a little bit more sense and i think that perhaps one area that that's been helpful and even in writing this book is that so many conservatives are logical um, uh, mathematical empirical they're structuring you know syllogistic arguments they're they're thinking then in, in in kind of dry intellectual terms and um, what I tried to bring to uh, the to the book and to all my work is a sense of drama conflict aesthetics um, telling a story kind of building out a narrative and I think that uh, in, in some ways, that as the thing has helped distinguish what I'm doing now. Yeah, so I'm gonna say, uh, you know, we mentioned this like a little bit before we started recording. Um, you know, the topic, uh, you know, these left wing intellectual movements and uh, revolutionaries, the long march to the institutions. And this, uh, you know, you're you're surfacing it right now. It's becoming a thing, um, and you've been talking about it for the last year or so. Uh, I, I'm probably familiar with it. I've read about critical theory and its intellectual history, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, so. Uh, there were there was some color in here that I didn't know, but in general I knew the general outline. But a lot of people are going to be surprised by this, you know. But you know we forget really quickly. Um, in the late two thousands, after two thousand eight, in particular, there was a whole period of interest in Saul Alinsky and all of these left wing radical movements that a lot of right wingers actually took an interest in. A lot of the mm -hmm. activism uh, was driven by let us learn from the left. And it's interesting how you're talking about it again. And, you know, I mean, your career, your prominence illustrates that there's a need for this. And somehow that faded again um, and it was forgotten so quickly. So it's interesting. And, you know, as you're um, talking about this and as I'm reading your book, um, it, I do think in a way, um, yes, yeah, so you are you're learning from what you've learned in terms of how they move through the institutions, how they use narrative story. Uh, drama, uh, dramatic effect, uh, rhetorical exaggeration, uh, just all, all you are using uh, the master's tools, you know, to go at the master's house, so to speak. I mean, that's what I was thinking as I was reading it. I'm just like, I can tell, I can tell like reading this that, uh, that you, you're learning, you learned yourself, you know, in terms of you're like, oh, you know, because I've seen um, as you evolved over the last three years and you know, um, you're not writing um, dry reports for AEI, you know, because I, I, I know what you're talking about in terms of like certain type of like conservative intellectual, you know, like let's talk about the Social Security uh, spend and, you know, the impending, you know, fiscal crisis and all that stuff. And that's great. And that's necessary. Uh, just like, you know, if you're a liberal, you know, Brookings needs to write, uh, you know, 1,000 page healthcare white paper that needs to be done. But then you also need kind of the poets. Uh, you need the, you know, kind of like visionaries. Uh, you need the dreamers. 
uh, that's all a spectrum. And so I think like, that's what you're alluding to here. In terms of your book, um, I know Richard Hanania, Dick Hanania has got a book out um, kind of on a similar topic. I actually haven't read his book, but so it's more about the legal framework. This book is more of a cultural history, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for sure. I think that, you know, I, I spoke with Richard on his podcast and I had a chance to, you know, pre-read the book and blurb the book. And he looks at it from a legal and institutional perspective. So what are the dynamics of the legal forms and processes that come stemming from the, the, the Civil Rights Act and, and related legislation and regulation? And how does it create the uh, institutional apparatus under woke? And so I mean, I think that's certainly important, and I think it's very complementary to what I'm doing, which is a narrative history of the the main figures who established the the key ideas, the key techniques in the late '60s, early '70s, and then documenting the long march of the institutions, and then showing the culmination of this, you know, 50 year march in 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 some on the ground reporting in 2020. And so, it's reportage, it's cultural history. Um, it's some intellectual portraiture, some kind of biographical treatments. Um, and so what I tried to do is create something of a three-dimensional um, picture, uh, a three-dimensional story, but also something that you could see, sink your teeth into narratively. Because, look, a lot of people, um, are, 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 are even, even people who love to read, um, cannot get through um, something that doesn't have a, a character, doesn't have, you know, conflict, doesn't have heroes and villains, doesn't have those basic narrative structures, which I think, you know, I even got criticism from the left. They say, well, you, Rufo doesn't make any uh, explicit arguments. He doesn't show why these ideas are bad. He doesn't make any uh, strong intellectual rebuttals. And I got kind of laughing because it's saying, well, yeah, I'm telling a story. And the 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 rebuttal of the, uh, the my case is implicit in the narratives. And so I'm showing what these ideas lead to. I'm showing the limitations of these ideas. I'm showing the corruption of the institutions. And so that, that is my argument. The argument is implicit, but a lot of, you know, PhD, social science, political theory types, you know, they want me to, to rebut point by point the critical theories, which I just think is, uh, you know, certainly someone should do it. You know, some have done it, but I think gives, you know, relatively less value actually than than relatively more yeah um so in terms of the book uh you know as you said it's you know it's got chapters they're quite focused on um uh, you know in, individuals uh often like angela davis herbert marcuse etc cetera, etc cetera. and yeah it's, it is narrative it's a narrative description it pulls you along i will say as i was reading it um one thing that i was feeling was like okay when am i gonna get to davis like you could tell that you had a narrative and the narrative had a progression, and that progression kind of matured into the current period, right? Like you were, you were starting yeah. kind of like the prologue of the current period, the 1960s, and you were moving. So, I mean, if that was your intent, you did a good job. I think it was it was it was clear. Um, one thing that I would say, you know, and I'm a little older than you, but not that much older than you. Uh, but um, you know, our perception of the 60s are, you know, like you say, zenial, you know, geriatric millennials, younger Gen X. We don't remember the 60s and early 70s. And one thing that I will say, um, and I get your take on this, people that live through it, they they have told me, you know, you guys get rose rose tinted, uh, you know, like sepia um, <laughs> colored perceptions in these like films of Woodstock and stuff like that. I don't want to get into the details. Like I've talked some some of the the darker details of stuff that happened in Woodstock that I was told by, you know, people that were there uh, in in adulthood. Um, and you know, the late sixties and the early seventies, 65 to 75, maybe 68 to 70, whatever this is the late seventies. Those were, I mean, you know, there's a book I think called days of rage. Um, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of, you know, there's like massive, um, uh, explosion of crime. Like we had a minor boomlet, um, over during the, you know, 2020 and which you had give reasons why we had the minor boomlet. But, um, you know, that was nothing compared to the change between, say, 64 and 70, which is six years. Uh, this is across someone's adolescence, possibly. It went from a very 1950s America to, in 1970, the crime rate was crazy. And yeah. so people underwent, like, these radical, radical changes. And I've talked to people that were, you know, in their 20s or late teens at the period and they just thought they, I mean, that's why like the Manson family happened and they thought the world was going to end because they just thought 
there's going to be a change every year. Like everything's going to like radically transform. And now, I mean, we are having changes, but really uh, compared to that period, history kind of stopped around 1980 and it's been a much more gradual change. You know, there's been technological changes and stuff like that. But our culture just underwent a literal revolution. Your your book is America's Cultural Revolution. It underwent a cultural revolution in a descriptive sense uh, between 65 and 70. So, you know, 65 is much closer in many ways to 50 or 45 than it is to 70. And um, I mean, what do you what do you what do you say to that? Like, how would you communicate it? Um, how did you try in the book? I think to the contemporary audience, like many of us who don't remember it uh, firsthand. Yeah, I, I think you're you're right, and and that's really why I bookend the you know I, I create the bookends or the the kind of time limitations that you know really from sixty eight forward. Although obviously talking about people's early life experiences, you go back further than that. But um, yeah, in in a sense, you're right, and 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 so, some have criticized the book to say, oh, you say it's America's cultural revolution. That's overstated. It's nothing. You know, it's not a, a cultural revolution of any kind. And then, but 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 to your point, you actually go back and you go into reading the pamphlets and the literature and the the kind of manifestos of sixty eight, sixty nine, seventy, and they're not talking about cultural revolution. Cultural revolution is actually a lowering of the ambition. They're talking about political revolution against the American constitutional government, and so they really truly believed at that time. You read Eldridge Cleaver. You read Angela Davis. You read. Um, uh, a number of other kind of Black Panther parties, Black Liberation Army uh, soldiers, they're writing, um, we are going to violently overthrow the government. Here is our kind of Gramscian or really a kind of Che Guevara, Guevaran theory of revolution. They said it's a FOCO plan. So you, you, you create spectacular images of revolutionary violence, assassinating police officers, bombing the U.S. Capitol, uh, robbing banks and taking hostages. Uh, demanding the, the the liberation from uh, the corrupt American society, and if we do that, we create a spectacular wave of violence. We will we will rally uh, uh, in an organic manner uh, the entire society to revolt against the government. I mean, they thought that they could. They were making actual plans. When we take over the United States government, this is what we're going to do. And you could argue for sure that it was delusional. You could argue that it was naive. You could argue that it was had no basis in reality. But the fact that enough people believed it and were willing to act on it and were willing to communicate it in such direct terms signaled to me that there was a perception among the broader society and the reaction from the government, the reaction from Hoover, the reaction from Nixon, where people had a fear this could really happen. And in 2020, obviously, we had people taking a knee to BLM. We had people posting the Black Square. We had people rioting in the streets. But I don't think that it was as a profound kind of revolutionary ambition as it was in the past. In a way, it was a cynical ambition. It defund the police was really as far as they were, were dreaming, which is a disaster, of course. But, um, but I, I think that one of the lessons that I learned writing the book was that the left has had n no new ideas since 1968. They were all fully baked by that time. Um, and, and, and the right needs to really understand the origins of these ideas, understand the range of discourse objects that they've created, uh, if, if we have any hope of, of turning, the, turning the country around. Yeah, I mean, you know, conflict sometimes is great for podcasts, but <laughs> I pretty much agree with you there. I mean, I've said the same things. I think you probably have seen me. No, no new ideas. I mean, the left wants to go back to the late 60s. Uh, the right wants to go back either to the 50s or the 1980s you know, make America great again. Um, you know, I mean, Ronald, or, you know, Donald Trump is a creature of uh, the 1980s, you know? I just like so when you think, I, I, I'd be curious what you think. I mean, when, 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 when Trump says make America great again, what's the reference? I mean, what is the, the, what is the point of reference that, that he, you, you think he's desiring a return to, or is it just an abstract desire that's no. filled in by his voters? No, I think, I think, I think he wants to, re I think he and his voters to some extent, um, and the, his voters, quote unquote, I mean, we're talking boomers here. Um, they, they do want to return to the eighties, uh, where, you know, America kind of resurrected itself from the brink in their perception, which, you know, whatever. I mean, I like the eighties. Like I remember it. It was great. Um, <laughs> the issue is just like, you can't turn back time at this point. A lot of things yeah. have changed. And I think that's why a lot of us who are younger, whether we're liberal or conservative, whatever your ideology, 
um, we're kind of frustrated. People, a lot of people are frustrated because the boomers are so demographically, um, they're just, they're not going, they're not leaving the, the field. And so you have these liberal boomers who are clearly, as you're outlining here, resurrecting a vision, you know, the dream of the sixties, you know, and then you have, uh, you know, conservative boomers and they want to go back to an America that just doesn't exist anymore, um, in a world that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, you know, as you get older, as we get older, everyone understands the appeal of that. Everyone understands the appeal of nostalgia and, you know, wanting to go back, but you can't. But um, speaking of going back, uh, doing a segue, I want to talk about Marcuse. Um, am I pronouncing that right? I actually never I know. Yeah. Not, okay. So he's, he's the old one, uh, so to speak, in your narrative. And he is um, he's a, a pretty critical figure. Um, I think, like, what was it? His essay, Repressive Tolerance, is that what it was? Uh-huh. Uh, Marcuse is the guy for people out there who is used basically to justify um, suppressing speech in the interests of promoting liberty and freedom, if that makes sense, which sounds super weird. But, you know, there is a logic. I mean, when you read um, when you read critical, you know, so the critical theory, cultural Marxism, um, can you talk about what these are, especially cultural Marxism, since that's the older older form, can you talk about what it is and how it's differentiated from the traditional materialist Marxism or the Soviet Union, democratic centralism a little bit so that people are clear? I and mean, this has been a huge yeah. thing to talk about. So. Yeah, Mar- Mar- Marcuse is really the, the pivotal figure here. And so, you know, to his credit, Marcuse was an orthodox Marxist, you know, uh, in, 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 in Germany, he participated in, uh, you know, kind of revolutionary politics in his time as a young man, uh, became a kind of Orthodox Marxist, actually in his early scholarship, he sought to revive some of Marx's early writings showing that Marx had a vision of humanity that wasn't, you know, as, as hemmed in by kind of materialist, dialectical materialism, um, some scholarship there. But when he came to the U.S., so really after World War II, um, he wrote a book called Soviet Marxism in which he uh, really brutalized the Soviet Union, said that it had devolved into uh, kind of, you know, a, a bureaucratic tyranny. He criticized the Soviet Union in 55, so very early on, when many of the uh, Marxists were still cheerleading the Soviet Union. Um, and and then he also realized in the West and Western Europe, but, you know, e- even more so in the United States, the old Marxist vision of proletarian revolution against the capitalist class was a dead end. You know, he saw correctly that you know, working class and middle class people in the United States loved their standard of living. They loved their country. They loved uh, they loved their boss uh, in in a way who allowed them to have you know the the home, the car, the vacation, you know, the station wagon, the dog, you know, the picket fence, the whole uh, American uh, kind of materialist American dream. And so he, you know, concluded the orthodox Marxist theory is dead. It will not work in any countries in the West, and it has not worked in the countries of the East, meaning uh, in, in, in Russia. And so he decided uh, to, instead of abandoning the, the dream altogether, he said, well, we need to find a new way in. And so he, th- he thought that you need to have a new proletariat or a new revolutionary subject. Um, and for him, it was the white intelligentsia and the black underclass. One could create the intellectual or ideological thrust, uh, taking over elite institutions, and then on, on the bottom side, socioeconomically, the, the black lumpen proletariat, whom uh, you know Marx would have uh, you know shied away from investing hope in, he thought that they could provide the the the, the muscle, the the, uh, the pressure, uh, and then the violence uh, in 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 inner cities, for example, that would create pressure on the regime from below. And that was his theory. Uh, uh, that that was his shift, and so. Um, in, in, in a way, it is a, a, a change of ambitions from seeking control of the means of material production, um, and his shift was towards seeking the means of cultural production, seeking control over those. And, and, I, and I think that, look, if you look at Marcuse's work from, you know, just in 68 and 69, just bracket those two years, all of his writing, correspondence, uh, and such, um, you have, I think, what is still... Um, the basic uh, architecture of left-wing ideology today. I mean, he, he, whether he invented it or whether he channeled the sentiment from others, there's a combination of both. But, but, but if you take it in, 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 as a whole, he, he laid the stamp down and we haven't emerged from it since. Yeah. One thing that I will say is um, 
you know, the tools, the tools were designed, uh, they were, they were crafted many decades ago. Um, they're being deployed extensively now, but what you're outlining is their genesis, their origin, um, their, you know, their creation. And, uh, I think people will be surprised, um, that they were pretty much fully formed very early. Uh, these, these, um, these arguments about, you know, we might use different terms, equity, diversity, inclusion, whatever, but they're, they're all originally the same arguments. It's just kind of like a, a leveling, uh, liberation, um, like a release from bourgeois norms, uh, from the structures and hierarchies of conventional life. Uh, they were all there. And um, I think, you know, um, what I would say, you know, as a critique or just like a, you know, a lot of the people, uh, like, let's say, you know, the people rioting in 2020, they don't know jack about Marcuse. They don't know what, you know, <laughs> cultural Marxism, all of this stuff is, right? That's actually like fundamentally true. And so there's yeah. a critique that people will say like, okay, why are you like bringing all this stuff in? Uh, they just want to riot. They just want to take stuff or, you know, it's like the, it's the, uh, they hate white people. Yeah. I've, I've seen that yeah. argument. Oh, they, it's not all of this theory. It's they hate white people. Yeah. What would you say to that? I mean, look, uh, I, I, I think that there is a temptation to reduce it to some kind of uh, uh, base desire or some kind of uh, instinctual outlet, some some rejection of, of the culture as such, uh, the desire for violence, the taste for the thrill of revolution. Um, you know, is there also some kind of racial sentiment at play? Yes. I mean, I think all of the above certainly have a part in this. Um, but but the question is is actually uh, should be bifurcated into two components in the same way that Marcuse bifurcated it, because y y you have that certainly the people who were, you know, smashing the windows of the shopping mall and, and, and stealing you know, televisions and shoes and refrigerators out of Target and, and running out, uh, uh, you know, back back into the, the, the neighborhood with their with their stolen goods. Are not reading Marcuse. Obviously, um, it's opportunistic. Um, it's it's a bit uh, you know. There's not like political consciousness that is operating. Yes, agree. However, the people who are leading these movements, if you look at BLM, and I think I profile the BLM leaders, and I show their connections with Marcuse, with the Weathermen, with Angela Davis, with Black Panther ideology, um, they are taking, shaping, reinforcing, and directing in a very politically conscious way, these uh, kind of subterranean or, or, or sub-political forces, and they are activating them and, and inciting them and directing them towards political objectives. Um, and, and, and I think so you have to look at it at both of those levels. I don't think you can reduce it neatly in either direction. But, but if you're going to reduce it uh, in either direction, you're, you're, you're going to have much better analysis if you reduce it up to show the, the political uh, direction, the political consciousness, the political objectives, then if you reduce it down and say, oh, they just don't like these kind of people, I, I think, okay, maybe that's true in part, but what do you learn from that? And so I think that there's a tendency among conservatives, and we should talk about this because it's been a debate that's been raging even the last week, to, to, to simply say, oh, this is all racial categorization and racial animus. That's all that drives it, and we need to have uh, a kind of racial politics that's commensurate with the racial politics of the left. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, my book might be instructive for people because in, in, in that regard and in that camp, because it's saying, well, I mean, yes, our racial categorizations, do, are they meaningful? Do they have political valence? Do they, do, they, do they influence how people feel and think and act? Obviously, yes. Um, but, but to try to dumb down conservative thought to a simple, you know, uh, you know, kind of caveman uh, style, uh, you know, racialism, I think is such a huge mistake. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's, I'm going to get to Angela Davis. We will loop back. It's easy to loop back to her. She's pretty colorful. I, I'm going to ask you about this because I don't, I kind of know what you're talking about. I mean, I'm busy with things, but someone asked me like, well, someone asked on a, a forum, you know, everyone's in chats now, but asked, uh, does Rufo believe in this? stuff and it was something about your um racial views which seemed like pretty bog standard so i was i don't know what what's going on here can you clue me in chris 
Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll clue you in, in in the kind of basic terms. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I am like uh, one who is, uh, uh, you know, very publicly, very openly, and 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 very ins- insistently um, uh, advance the idea that the the standard of colorblind equality is still the the best possible standard towards which we should aspire. Offers the most hope of providing a sense of uh, fairness and unity and and equal treatment um, and in a complex multi-ethnic and multiracial society in my view is the only method uh, for for having a, a coherent and effective and good system of government and there is obvious pressure on the left which I've exposed at length I talk about in the book at length they want to have a DEI style racial spoil system that rewards and punishes based on ancestry. So the disfavored groups, mostly whites and Asians, or the favored groups, mostly Latinos and African Americans, um, should be categorized, sorted, judged, and equalized in any kind of prestige, economics, you know, uh, um, uh, advancement, education, you know, discipline, etc. So artificially tilting the scales based on these categories. Um, and on the right, there is a, a kind of maybe perennial, but I think also even currently a rising sentiment that the, the colorblind equality standard has failed. Um, it's been baked out of existence by the, by the, the ruling kind of DEI style uh, governing regime. And the solution is to adopt the techniques of uh, racial identity politics on the right uh, to raise, you know, what, what some would call uh, racial consciousness, and then to have a kind of unapologetic advancement of, uh, of, of this categoriz- categorization and, and rewards and punishments simply reversed. Um, and so I've, I've been taking heed for arguing against that. Um, and, and, and I just think that it, look, it's, I think it's morally a dead end. Um, but even if you set aside a moral concern, I think politically it's a dead end. You know, people don't want that. Uh, I think that even American, you know, European Americans do not want that by and large. And certainly you're also then alienating um, uh, other groups, um, uh, you know, other racial groups that are winnable in a political sense, a practical sense, uh, you know, particularly uh, Asians, South Asians, Latinos, uh, you know, Latin Americans, you know, uh, Central Americans, South Americans are eminently uh, winnable politically for conservatives. And it strikes me as just a kind of, you know, what I think it actually drives it is a, a, a you know, bizarrely, you know, the, the, the wokes are right, a sense of an inferiority and, and an inferiority complex and a retrenchment and a, and a, and a retreat um, to, to, to say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, have to stay with people that, that look like us. And I think that that is such a, um, I, I think that it is such a mistake. I don't think it's consistent with the, the founder's vision. Um, and, and I think that it is a kind of embrace, a pre-embrace of failure. It's a politics of failure um, that, that I, that I you know, strongly argue against. Wait, is this, okay, now I'm, I'm starting to like connect some dots here. Uh, Charlie Kirk, it's okay to be white. Is this part of that? <laughs> yeah, I think he said, you know, whiteness is great. You know, every, everyone should be proud of their, 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 their kind of racial ancestry. Yeah, so I, you know, I responded and like, you know, Everyone's mileage varies. I just like quote tweeted like I don't like I'm not offended by it, but I'm just like what I said is like it just this seems kind of cringe to me. Whenever people yeah. do whatever their ethnicity when they do that, I'm like really that's what you got to be proud of. Like you didn't do anything for that. You just born that. You know, it's just like it, it's not. It doesn't seem to be like a big brag. So I I didn't really understand where that came from. I mean whatever. I know people that are on the staff and they like to troll and stuff like that. But yeah, so I, I think, think that's, that's right. Pretty, but I think it also is a kind of re- reflection sentiment, and and there is a large group on the right that is advancing that kind of politics, and and the idea of of the phrasing. And look, I get it. Obviously, in itself, you, to say um, it's okay to be white was kind of the bait um, uh, uh, to say, look, these folks on the left don't think it's okay to. And so, okay, I get the troll in itself. It is relatively anodyne. But it's a it's a two part argument. It's a kind of um, uh, it's a kind of bait uh, for for an idea that represents a, a larger idea, um, and 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 the larger idea that is that is kind of the toe dipping. This is a toe dipping mechanism. Is 
um, you know, it's okay to have a you know, racial politics. Everyone should be allowed to have a racial politics and we should advance a racial politics. And so I think to, to the extent that it means that, that it's more than just a troll or just a tease or just a bait, um, I, I think that it's an idea that, that should be raised to the surface and, and debated internally on the right. Um, and, uh, and I was surprised, and I still am surprised, to the extent to which there is a desire uh, for that kind of politics. And so I, I think we should, look, put it out in the open. And, and what, I, you know, w- what I would say is that a couple of things. One, from the practical sense, you know, whiteness is a, a left-wing term that is loaded down with connotations. To appropriate it and then to flip the, 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 the sentiment of those connotations, I think is a waste of time. And, and I, think is also, um, I, I think is also kind of a reductionist idea of there is a racial essence. Uh, there is a racial spirit at play that we should elevate and celebrate. And, and I think that uh, I, just, I, just, I don't think that is true. I, 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 would, I would contest that idea you know, metaphysically. And I would also say, look, at the same time, you know, Europeans, you're, you're a great student of history, you know, history from, from multiple continents. Um, Europeans have a great history. Europeans have great accomplishments in arts, literature, commerce, philosophy, government, you know, dating back to the, you know, to, 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 the, to the, you know, Greeks and Romans and, and Middle Ages and Renaissance. I mean, you, I believe in a classical liberal arts tradition oriented to the West, um, and I believe there's a lot of great uh, accomplishments there that should be celebrated. But to say in a kind of simplistic way, and therefore this is a celebration of whiteness as such, I think misses the point entirely. And I think reduces it to a, a very, you know, prison gang politics that to me is, is, is abhorrent and to me um, is not even consonant with the great spirit of the West, which proposed the, the individual and proposed the universal they're stuck in that middle range of warring tribes. And I think that the, the great poles of the, the individual and the universal is our great inheritance in the West and is different than many other societies. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying here. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I guess I, I don't honestly take it uh, super seriously, partly because it's, uh, how do I, I'm just gonna say it, I think it's LARPing. Um, uh, they're not, they're live action role playing. Um, you know, they're like, we, you know, you know, our ancestors, the Vikings and all this weird stuff. And it's fine. Like I know the history, like I'm actually like pretty interested in it. Um, but, uh, if the Vikings saw these people, they would be all right. You know, uh, it's, uh, it, this isn't, it's not, it's not serious thinking. Um, it's as serious as the, uh, racial separatism on the left, which I also think to a great extent is play acting. Um, yes, it has real consequences in our lives, but they actually never execute fully the vision that um, they espouse because they cannot in the United States of America. Angela Davis, uh, who let's talk about her, this uh, brilliant uh, black radical who's still around, who's still lionized in the academy, um, um, who has been involved in criminal activities, you know, communist agitation. Uh, she herself is a refutation of um, of this sort of racialism. Her biological grandfather, exposed uh, through DNA evidence on uh, Finding Your Roots, is a uh, white Alabama law- lawyer, John A. Darden. Um, and so this is America, and this is the future of black separatism. Um, you know, so uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but it's, it's a joke. Um, and, and its inversion is also a joke because, you know, this is the country we live in. And again, you know, you're not going to go back in the, in, you know, both of us, uh, you know, I don't want to say like, you know, we have like mixed children. Like, we don't, I don't like reduce my children that way, but it's just like, there's just yeah. too many. You're not going to get rid of us uh, deal and let's just move on. But whatever you can, people can have their LARPs and like, you know, uh, spout off on group chats. Uh, you know, they're 22, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's why too. And I think with the, some of the folks on the right, it's like, I think people need to be l- l- led into a, an optimistic politics, a, a successful politics, um, uh, a politics where they can they can see a much better way on both left and right. Um, and to the extent that 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 you know I can contribute to that, that's something that I'm interested in doing. And 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 I think that you're right. And in in, in in a way, look, these are LARPs, these are trolls, these are engagement bait. Um, but I think there is a serious um, there is a serious consequence to some of these ideas. And I think that look. 
it, there is also a double standard for a variety of reasons where the left's uh, kind of identity politics can turns into policy and actually has a very negative consequence uh, for, for people in the real world um, and should be fought on those grounds as well as the kind of prior grounds. But on the right, uh, this kind of LARPing just turns into um, fodder for the left to, to, to beat up on the right. And in a sense, justifiably, um, but, but in another sense to say, hey, wait a minute, if you're just LARPing, if you're just trolling, um, it strikes me as something that is um, you know, not only wrong on the substance, but if it's just a troll, there's irony at play, but even just to pragmatically, politically, it's counterproductive. And that's why I think that it's driven in a sense by inferiority. Um, it's driven um, in a sense by uh, a kind of cynicism. And I think it has to be met with a, a kind of optimistic, successful politics that demonstrates a, a better path. And, 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 and look, a lot of these folks are young, disillusioned, upset, angry on both left and right. Um, and I think that both of us on the, you know, kind of on the left and on the right have an obligation to try to um, uh, counteract the bad instincts of, 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 of the flanks. And you'll be, you know, said that you're a gatekeeper or, or, or playing respectability politics. There's a whole kind of discourse around that, but 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 yes, I mean yes, there there are gatekeep, there is gatekeeping, there is respectability politics. Uh, those are good things, uh, and and I think that you know you know you you shouldn't you know gatekeep to protect your own status in a selfish way. Obviously, that's the kind of kind of no good. Um, but yeah. there has to be a mechanism in politics to 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 sort and rank ideas, um, and 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 that's what politics is for is, is in a sense to to create rank orders and to prioritize and to, and to deprioritize on the basis of the merit of the ideas. Yeah. Let's, let's take, I think we should distinguish between two things here when you talk about politics in a way and what's going on. Um, there is a, a broad politics that affects change. Uh, you are a change effector. We're probably not going to get to it today with the universities and new college in Florida, but uh, you know, your, your activism has led to real world results, which is one reason why you are a hate figure on the left. Cause you know, you're doing stuff. Uh, so you're not just uh, you're not just uh, brandishing your own personal brand. And then there's like the personal brand politics. And I think that's what you're talking about. A lot of these, uh, you know, white identity or whatever they want to call themselves. It's fine. I don't care. But it's personal brand politics. It's not really every, anything that's going to be actualized and realized in the real world in any any future path that we can see in the next generation. OK, so it's it's a dead end. I think that's probably what's frustrating you because you like to actually do things um and actually like have a positive productive vision for the future which this isn't this is basically uh just uh you know spending people like you know it, the iron law of institutions is that people will increase their status within the institution or their salience or their relevance or their prominence while degrading the institution itself so if you are on the right um a bunch of people larping as vikings and whatever romans or what or greeks that's just kind of funny and it's actually not it's not forwarding what you want to forward although like we are now talking about them implicitly so it's increasing their own personal brand i think this is what you're getting into um where it's it's hard to you need to um you need to police people to stay in line because you have ultimate values ultimate ends mm -hmm. and they're just like we just want to have fun because we're hopeless it's kind of what's going on yeah i think there's a lot of truth to that and and i think that um you know, there, there's a kind of related, but but in some ways distinct category as well, where where you know I I I've, I've kind of have this little heuristic or this little kind of uh, uh, kind of quick 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 method of evaluation to say, well, are they doing literature or are they doing politics? Uh, so so is it literature or politics? You know, and 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 so um, you know, are they advancing an actual politics capable of governing or changing laws or reshaping institutions? Or are they, you know, building that personal brand through um, uh, kind of in the media side of things? And look, I love both of those things. I, I, I think that kind of media personalities is fascinating in its own way. Um, but for me, I prioritize politics. And I really always try to ask myself, Am I doing politics? You know, it, it, how can I actually, um, uh, uh, you know, deliver political victories in a real substantive way? 
and and so th- that to me is my ultimate uh, standard of judgment, and 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 that's where I have a you know cascade of decisions and evaluations stemming from that, um, and 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 that's why I think yeah I mean get frustrated with multiple classes of uh, of figures on left and right, and and even within the right, and you know the opposite of the kind of identity politics crowd on the right is the kind of never Trump crowd and uh, the the conservatives uh, who you know, uh, who have a professional career at bad mouthing and attacking and undermining other conservatives, uh, you know, on the op-ed pages or, or, or wherever. And those are actually people playing the same game in a sense. They're not actually interested in advancing anything. They're interested in bolstering their own reputations and bolstering their own profiles and bolstering their own subscriber numbers uh, in a way that is, you know, Im- implicitly and sometimes explicitly self-defeating. You know, there's no there's no uh, 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 there's no advanced idea, and I think that on that side as well, I've been thinking about this a lot, and uh, it's it's saying okay, well, you look at the never Trump kind of crowd, you look at all of their writings from let's say you know 2000 to 2015, 15 years of writing, um, you know, all of that writing would be very happy to 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 uh, you know get rid of CRT, to fight gender you know theory in schools, to reshape and retake universities. All these issues I'm working on, they have 15 years of, of intellectual argument that would naturally lead to the conclusion, well, we should do something about it. These are governing issues. This has relevance to the public. Let's make some reforms. But all of a sudden, they flipped on all of these issues. Oh, you know. And so it's like, wait a minute. They were doing literature this whole time. They were very comfortable writing for the conservative magazine, complaining about X, Y, and Z. But they never intended to pose a threat to the advancement of these ideologies. They never had a viable theory of institutional change. And when the weather changed, when the weather flipped rather with Trump, they said, well, we're not actually interested in doing anything anyway. So we might as well, you know, kind of play that uh, defector role, play that, uh, you know, kind of uh, kind of moral figure role uh, and, and, and really juice our, our, our numbers in that sense. And so I think that actually they were playing the same game the whole time. They just ad- adapted their strategies uh, in order to 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 maximize the given calculation at the time, and so I, I, I think that I, I on, on so on both sides, right? Those are in some ways the two kind of flanks of the right. I, I, I just I, I have like really deep antipathy uh, toward towards both ends and towards both groups. You are you are you're you're a man of action. Uh, that is that is who you are, and that's why you're frustrated. Uh, speaking of of people of action, women of action. Let's let's talk about Angela Davis. Um, yeah, I think most people have heard the name. Uh, she is, unlike Marcuse, she is still a name that I think the regular person on the street would hear about. Uh, you know, when I was in academia, some people would talk about her in admiring ways, and that's what I realized. Well, not, I mean, I always knew, but I was just like, oh, God, the double standard here, because I mean, she's a communist, she's pro-communist, involved in violent revolution, all of this stuff. This is not someone... Who should be praised and tolerated? But she was. Can you can you talk a little bit about her biography? Uh, it's actually uh, quite interesting in some ways. Uh, the the beginning uh, the beginning of her life, which I actually didn't know too much about from where she came from, was heartening. But then uh, it took a dark turn. When I was yeah, talking. and and that's right. And I think that's really the the story and the structure of uh, in the book. And I think you know, faithful to the facts of all of these figures. You know, Angela Davis grew up. Um, uh, in, 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 in Birmingham, Alabama, she saw uh, racism, discrimination, violence, hatred. Um, she had these, uh, you know, by all accounts, really wonderful uh, parents that were dedicated to their family, that made their way the best that they could, uh, achieved a kind of middle class lifestyle, um, and then sent her to study uh, in New York City as a very young uh, teenager. Um, she went to this uh, little red schoolhouse, like a left-wing communist uh, 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 educational institution in, in New York City, where she was you know, introduced to the Communist Manifesto. She said it struck her like a lightning bolt, and that was her entry into revolutionary politics. And she then got a scholarship. Uh, she was rewarded academically because she was a very bright student, um, co- connected with Herbert Marcuse, became his student, became his graduate student, traveled through Europe, traveled in the United States, and then became enamored with the Black Panthers, became enamored with the Communist Party USA, um, and, and then you know took the ideas that she inherited from Marcuse of Kant and Hegel and Marx, the great European philosophers uh, of the previous centuries, 
but then somehow concluded uh, that that racial revolution was the was the the conclusion to the premise of those philosophies, uh, and violence was the method of revolution that she endorsed. And so she was involved in these very violent revolutionary movements. Uh, she participated in them by providing weapons that ended up in the courthouse siege uh, that left numerous people dead. Um, she became a fugitive and then a hero um, of the Soviet Union, of the communist uh, countries, and even of the radical left within the United States. Um, and then, you know, kind of disappeared into academia for a number of decades, uh, where she you know, built her brand, continued her work, translated the revolutionary ideas into an academic environment, um, and uh, and then you know gave speeches and mentored you know the Black Lives Matter uh, founders and 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 established her legacy of influence. But you have to really question her judgment, both the judgment of of her ideas, uh, the judgment of her personal conduct. And then the, the ultimate judgment is when her ideas gain power, when they're implemented in cities or states or, or nationally, what do they yield? And in every case, they yield disaster. They yield death. Uh, they yield the deaths in particular of poor uh, black people in, in, in rough neighborhoods. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, you say, well, is Angela Davis liberating the black poor from poverty, from ignorance, from violence, from oppression. Um, and if that is her own standard, d does, even in, d d does she even on her own terms uh, uh, deliver the goods? And the answer is always and has always been and I think uh, will always be no. And so my argument is implicit where I'm showing the, the ideas, the genesis, the origins. I'm showing the intellectualization and rationalization of these ideas. And then I'm showing implementation. And so that arc uh, to me, in all the cases of the people that I profile, shows very clearly where these ideas lead, and it's nowhere good. Well, I want to I want to bring something up here uh, because a lot of people are not super aware of this. You allude to it uh, in your comments here, right in the book. Um, you talk about communism, and you know we talk about cultural Marxism and Marcuse, but uh, you know in the sixties, seventies, eighties, left wing governments and Soviet communism was actually quite involved and integrated with these radical movements. Can you talk about Angela Davis, her association with Soviet communism, international communism, also the Black Panthers to some extent? Um, this is, I think, uh, especially growing up in the 80s, we heard about communism, how it was bad, but uh, it was never drilled home until like, I read a little bit about it. Like, you know, like the Beiter Meinhof, you know, uh, complex, all that stuff. They were funded uh, and backed by East Germany, Soviet Union, uh, there were governments, left-wing communist totalitarian governments, backing these radical movements. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, they backed them, they housed them, they celebrated them, they turned them into you know propaganda units. Uh, and Angela Davis, in particular, after she was acquitted, I think outrageously, from her involvement in the in the murder and and death of a, of a judge and other people in the courthouse siege, uh, seeking to 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 break people out of prison violently. Uh, uh, you know, she was acquitted. And then where did she go? She went to the Soviet Union. She did a tour of the Soviet Union. She became a great propaganda tool for the Soviet Union. And when, when I opened the book, uh, uh, the, the early part of the book with this great story that was told by Solzhenitsyn, and he says, you know, Angela Davis was touring uh, the Soviet Union and she was approached by some Czech dissidents who said, you know, Angela Davis, you are, you are a political prisoner you, you, you say political prisoners must be liberated. You, you're, 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 you know that um, you know, repression and, and, and political imprisonment is an evil. You know, we have Czech dissidents in Soviet prisons now that they're, they're there unjustly. And she says very coldly to them, let them rot in prison. They get what they deserve. And, 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 and so it, it is this amazing international power politics where she participates in the propaganda because it benefits her and the, the Soviet Union and its satellites – uh, it, it invest in the propaganda uh, because it, 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 it benefits them. And so she was more than willing to play the tool of Soviet power because she ultimately believed in the mission of the Soviet Union. She believed in the mission of the third world uh, revolutionaries, the Marxist-Leninist regimes uh, in Latin America and Africa and Asia. She believed in them long after it was known that they were uh, uh, conducting atrocities and so Angela Davis has no excuse. Her mentor, her graduate advisor, Herbert Marcuse, in 1955, you know, 
15 years, you know, more than 15 years prior, had outlined in very unclear, in very clear terms, rather, that that the Soviet Union was 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 evil, was was a disaster, was a repressive regime. But but she was so invested in any method possible um, in, in in achieving her political objectives that that she was willing to put all of that aside and and say these are these are these are my people. I, I would I would align with the Soviet Union more than I would align with the United States. And and I think that in retrospect, I mean, you're, even at the time it was obvious, but especially in retrospect, I mean, it 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 seems um, almost unbelievable to people who didn't grow up in, in that time period that there would be very smart, very intelligent Americans that were all in on the Soviet Union, all in on communist China, when it was known to any educated person what was happening in those countries. Yeah, it's it's super weird. Um, I want to actually mention, since you brought that up, uh, I didn't know this. Uh, I knew a little bit about it, but <laughs> actually, I'm not shocked uh, from what I've heard. Uh, so uh, the Weather Underground, um, Bernadine Dorn's group, uh, you know, with Ayers, Bill Ayers, uh, Obama's mentor, um, in the late 1960s, they had plans for um, genocide, it, like political genocide. Can you can you talk about that? Like that was that was new to me. They did, yeah. It was kind of an amazing moment, and I and I, I you know really borrowed from that book you mentioned earlier, Days of Rage. Um, I borrowed from some of the firsthand accounts. I borrowed from some of the uh, informants' accounts, and tried to paint together uh, the you know this 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 picture of of the atmosphere and. They held a revolutionary council in Flint, Michigan, that was, you know, alcohol, drugs, orgies, uh, you know, Mar- uh, you know, Charles Manson uh, worship, um, uh, putting, you know, people's names on the board that they were going to execute. And then in the in the struggle sessions, uh, they would, you know, d- denounce their white skin privilege. That's the origin of the white privilege exercise is from the Weather Underground's revolutionary councils. Um and they actually had, you know, kind of half baked, stoned, uh, uh, you know, bull sessions, but you know, with with serious intentions at the very least. Okay, when we get control of the United States government, what are we going to do with the 25 million, you know, conservative Americans, anti-communist Americans? How are we going? Who are we going to kill? Who are we going to execute? Um, and then which ones must be sent to re-education camps to, to brainwash them uh, to, towards our ideology? And so. They were making, you know, half baked, you know, half stoned plans, but they genuinely believe, okay, we have a, a path to victory, and we better start at least thinking in broad terms. Who's going to get the rope? You know, who's going to get, uh, 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 you know, forced into these, you know, uh, rehabilitation camps in, in New Mexico or wherever they might be? Um, and you know, I, I think that ultimately we. Ha- have in a sense a similar spirit at play institutionally, shorn of the LSD, shorn of the you know the 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 mass executions, obviously, but it's evolved, it's grown up, it's professionalized, it's rationalized, and we have white privilege exercises in elementary schools now, um, and it's very uncomfortable, but I think it's justified to say that these originated in these revolutionary milieu. And they've simply migrated into your kid's, you know, school classroom. And, uh, and, and of course, this is what I exposed in 2020. This was the genesis of the critical race theory backlash. Um, but uh, it's actually much worse than the left says. The left tried to deny it or tried to say it's about kindness. I mean, it's much worse than even I presented to the public because I didn't even present the true history because I thought that that would, that would appear almost unbelievably yeah. and had to be tackled in book form. Yeah, I'm going to give you an example of, um, um, and like, and let, speaking of white privilege, let's talk about the Pacific Northwest because, uh, you know, as we're closing out. Uh, but uh, the the BLM uh, manifesto, uh, that was a communist manifesto. It was a crazy communist manifesto, but when it was online. And I had friends who were like, you know, normal liberal Democrat type people who were like, yeah, Black Lives Matter is great. And I was just like, no, it's communist. They're like, what are you talking about, Razib? Like, I know you're conservative, but like, why do you have to call everything communist? I was like, look at the manifesto. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, like, literally, they were, they were like, wait, is this for real? Like, are you making this up? Like, is this a real website? Like, they actually could not believe that they had just put the communist, like, they, they put the manifesto out there and no one bothered to check that it was literally communist. Like they just yeah. no one bothered to check. So my friends are just like, 
you know, they, they didn't really want to say that they opposed it, but they were just like, yeah, I'm not sh- sure I'm comfortable with all of this. <laughs> so the, the whole thing was like, it, so yes, I know what you're saying. Like sometimes when you when you put the, the truth in front of people, they don't even know how to take it, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, the, the manifesto was unbelievable. And But it's not just a manifesto. You know, I, I quote in the book from, you know, Patrice Cullors was doing articles and speeches in the Harvard Law Review that were very explicit. We are Marxist, Leninist, revolutionaries. We are taking the kind of politics of of, of, of all these various social movements and, and, and creating revolution. I mean, they, they said all these things very explicitly. It's not like they're hiding them even, although they hid them when they were exposed to scrutiny. They backed away from it for sure. Yeah, they, 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 but yeah I mean, look, look at the, well, what do they want? Well, they wrote a manifesto. Let's maybe read it and see what it says. Um, and, and, and I think that that is um, almost half the battle is just showing what they're really doing. And, and I think that the left operates quite brilliantly in that way where they have the, the I guess you could call it in debate terms, the Martin Bailey. But I think it's more as the, the, the kind of the, 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 the substance and the and the marketing, um, you know, the marketing language is, you know, if you care about justice, post the black square on Instagram and show your solidarity against police violence and that's very i mean look in, if it was just that uh if that was the only the, the, the true substance of it and the actual meaning i would say great yes obviously we want to have everyone's life uh, matter we want to have uh, uh you know a uh, uh, police uh, always behaving at a standard of professionalism and not unjustifiably uh harming or 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 or, or, or killing people i mean obviously you know we what we have a history of injustice in our country that we should strive to to overcome yes all of those things are great. And I see why, especially, you know, uh, uh, kind of more um, empathy oriented people immediately say, yes, I want to participate in this. I get it. But you say, well, well, let's look under the hood a little bit and see what they're really trying to do as with that as their tool. Um, and then you actually have a very different conversation. And that's the conversation that I'd like to have. Um, and even though the conversation for, for quite a while, the New York Times was unwilling to have, unwilling to even legitimate. Uh, in, in, in in its coverage, um, and uh, but but I think that ultimately we, we we really did by identifying it as critical race theory, by moving it forward as critical race theory, by um, showing the evidence of the documents. I think we ultimately um, broke their 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 shell of euphemism and marketing language, and actually had the real debate. Well, wait, so you actually had a, a piece in the New York Times, the end of July. Um, I know that that wouldn't have been allowed verboten in twenty twenty one or whatever. Uh, did you get, was there any, um, did the Times get any blowback for platforming you, as they say, because, you know, you're such a, you're such a marginalized figure uh, that has like no avenues to get your word out there, you know, besides the New York Times? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I was surprised, you know, my, my book editor said, hey, you should pitch an op-ed to the Times as your book is coming out to, to, to be a great, great opportunity. And, uh, you know, so I said, all right. I mean, I, I suppose, but I doubt that they'll, you know, print something from me. I just, my own, actually my own limited thinking, to be honest. And then, so I sent in a pitch, sent this kind of spec thing. Hey, I'm thinking about this, you know, would you take it? And the editor said, yes, looks great. I would love to publish it. And they put it through fact checking. They had the chief fact checker, five rounds of revisions, uh, heavy, you know, editing and say, hey, can you add this? Can you add this? They anticipated all the lines of criticism. Hey, we think our readers or the critics are going to say, X, Y, and Z, can you make bolster it here? And so, and, and then they had very rigorous fact checking on each of the empirical points. And I mean, I was impressed, to be honest, with the le- level of editorial care that they put into it, kind of multiple weeks of revisions, because they knew if we publish Rufo, it's going to be kind of a firestorm. We better be ready. And so I, I really um, gained a legitimate respect uh, for the editors, appreciation for the editors. And I think that, you know, and this is I'm reading into it. They didn't say this explicitly. But I think that they actually have sensed that the conversation has shifted, have sensed that I represent a legitimate um, mainstream, maybe even a majority opinion on this important discussion. Um, and that I was, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, they were also kind of dialectically or, or even politically ready um, to to include my point of view in the debate, and so I think it was very conscious. I, I, again, guessing, reading into it, they didn't say this to me explicitly. I didn't ask. Well, it wasn't important for my purposes, but I, I think that that's. And I think it was also a marker to say, "Hey, we're going to open up the debate a little bit broader. It's not 2020 anymore." And 
you know, the, the left wing activists, you know, they called for my execution, they called for my imprisonment, you know, they called for the Times to, you know, to denounce and to, to retract, but it didn't work at all. It fell totally flat. And actually, they ended up looking ridiculous. And the, the Times then published this really, and I don't know if they do this, I'm not a big New York Times reader, but they published an entire second article with like eight letters to the editor um, responding to my piece. So it was an entire feature article of just uh, kind of a public a kind of a compilation of letters responding to it, most of which were critical, obviously. Um, but but I think that it was a sense of uh, the Times finding the center, finding the strength, opening up the terms of debate. And in that sense, I think it's a positive uh, development. Okay. Well, I mean, speaking of negative developments, I'm going to end on a downer. Uh, let's let, let's talk about the very Northwest. Um, so uh, before we, were, we got on, like, you did not know I am actually an Oregonian, so uh, the chapter is related to Seattle. And I have family in the Seattle area. My my brothers are Huskies, uh, UW Huskies. Uh, so I, I know Seattle a bit. Definitely Portland. I lived in Portland. Um, you know, lived in Eugene. Like people know that. What years did you live in Portland or Ashland or Eugene? What? What yeah. years did you live in in Portland? Uh, mostly the 2000s. In, well, I mean Eugene in the nineties, ninety, yeah. and then uh, and then Portland in the early two thousand. Yeah, yeah, and like yeah. I lived in Portland. I lived on 32nd and Division. I can dox myself now. It's really nice now. It wasn't as nice back yeah. then. Uh, I went. I went back to, to the house that I rented. It's, it's still there. It's still nice. Um. Uh. So I actually have a lot of friends in the area. I have friends that left for Bend and Vancouver and elsewhere and from Portland. Um. I think Seattle. I mean, honestly, I think Seattle spiked. Uh, pretty intensely with Chaz. You talk about Chaz. We can talk a little bit about that. But Portland has had the most of the two cities has had the most uh, long standing degradation in brand or longer degradation. I think between the two, I think this is partly just due to Seattle has Seattle is more business oriented at the end of the day, and you know to be candid, just more Asians. And uh, you know at the, at the end of the day, yeah. they're just going to be like, okay, this is enough. Portland, you were whacked out, uh, uh, whacked out white. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Portland, you know, they're let's just call them be generous, idealistic people. Um, so I will, I'll let you tell the story of what happened for because like, there's a lot of people who have no idea what the Pacific Northwest is like and what happened and stuff like that. All they know is you know salmon and you know whatever uh, you know. <sighs> but um, so I, I got a message from a friend of mine whose uh, family owns property in Portland and he grew up grew up in Beaverton, you know, uh, which you mentioned. Um, and I have a lot of friends that grew up in Beaverton. And uh, he uh, uh, said that apparently um, a bunch of like kind of like, I mean, like this guy's a professional. I'll say that. Like, you know, he went to graduate school and all that stuff. And he's got a good job and makes a lot of money. But he has friends that kind of dropped out, you know, like smoking weed. And maybe they, you know, went to Portland to retire. They work like five hours <laughs> at the coffee shop, you know, like like really Portlandia life. But apparently they were just Love like. It. They were like, they were like texting them. They're like, yeah, like we're gonna go, we're gonna go riot, you know, like that's that's what they were kind of doing. They were like super excited. Uh, they were gonna go riot, and you know, so uh, you know, uh, it's like the stuff that you talk about in the book. Like people would be like, is this for real? I'm like, like no, I know it's real because, like, I know people who did exactly what you said. Like it was a fun yeah. time for them. Uh, they had nothing going on. Uh, they were gonna like burn some buildings down, bring the revolution. Um, you know, they were going to like, you know, put their gauges in, you know, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, like have some like vegan organic food. I mean, like the whole life was there and it kind of matured and uh, putrefied and just, you know, became, you know, Portland today, it just does not have the brand that it did 10 years no. ago, you know, and it's destroyed yeah. it. It's like you took a good thing and honestly, you just. You went too far. You know, there's a little bit of revolution is is cute, uh, but like burning down public buildings, disorder, uh, mass vagrancy, all of the things are just like quality of life hits that eventually people cannot tolerate, and they just move out. And you know, uh, I will say one last thing: they almost like elected Portland. The, 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 this is on the people. They almost elected a Maoist as mayor. Yeah. You know, yeah. so talk about talk about Pacific Northwest. We'll close out yeah. with that so the people know, get a sense of like, OK, like you talk about Marcuse and Angela Davis. OK, that's history. Like this is reality. Yeah. I, I mean, the Northwest is I mean, the Northwest has always had 
at first it was a more libertarian spirit, you know, obviously the pioneers, the frontier, uh, it's the last outpost in the continental United States. Um, it's the, the, the gateway to Alaska and the people who are really willing to uh, go all the way in that frontier life. Um, but it's also had a, a very left-wing uh, labor history. The Wobblies, the IWW, the International uh, Workers, uh, ha had their, their kind of union brawls that even 100 years ago and their conflict with Seattle mayors. And, and so there's always been a, a libertarian and a libertarian left-wing culture and, 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 and social movements in Seattle. Obviously, in Seattle, you have the World Trade Organization. You have high densities of, of anti-fascist protesters, anti-globalism protesters, uh, left-wing radicals, revolutionaries, etc. But there was this kind of holiday period that you're talking about. And that's why I asked you, well, what years? In the 2000s and even the early 2010s, frankly, up until about 2015, I think with Trump, honestly. Seattle and Portland were incredible. I mean, they were low cost of living. They were high quality of life. It was an adventurous culinary culture. It was kind of a peaceful, you know, hippie culture, you know, where young people go to retire was the slogan for Portland. Um, people wanted to live a lifestyle. Uh, they wanted to opt out of any kind of, uh, you know, bourgeois expectations and professionalism. Like I'm actually very attracted to that culture in some some part of me. And and so I would go down from Seattle. Um, and, and Seattle is, of course, more corporate. It's Amazon, Boeing, uh, uh, um, Microsoft, and, and big high tech. Yeah, Seattle's it's a different culture. Big, but Seattle's a button-down big brother. Exactly. Seattle is like, uh, you know, people from all over, you know, wearing the short sleeve, uh, button-down shirts and, and coding. Um, but, but we would go down to Portland all the time, even seven, eight years ago, you know, 2013, 14, 15. We would go down to Portland for the weekend and it was great. It was beautiful. You'd have coffee, you'd walk around, you'd go to the cool kind of rehab neighborhoods, you'd, you'd, you'd participate in the kind of quirky, you know, kind of hippie culture as a kind of observer. It was entertaining. Um, but, but it, I mean, it really took a very drastic turn. I think with in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, you had um, now 10 encampments everywhere. You had uh, kind of in, in, in visible increase in crime and disorder. And then you had the, the very aggressive elevation of Antifa and then paradoxically given Portland's demographics, BLM radicals. And then you had this kind of revolution for sport. And then also you had, um, I think, a very clear attraction of the uh, mentally disordered and even outright mentally ill um, uh, d cohorts and demographics that sought Portland as a place where there were no rules and restrictions. You could live on the street. Um, you could, you could, you know, uh, participate in in kind of uh, uh, politically coded violence. Um, you could shoplift without any consequences. And so you have this, and then you could participate in a great cause, much like the the Weather Underground. Those those revolutionary um, sentiments could be you know, an outlet for your maybe your your borderline personality disorder or whatever it might be. And and, and so this it became this 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 um, magnet for that kind of person, that kind of culture, that kind of politics. And the other problem though was the kind of hyper liberal, hyper compassionate, you know, hyper progressive governing elite was unable to put any limitation or restriction on that kind of culture. And so you had the collapse of any limits, you had the increase in disorder, homelessness, political uh, kind of political agitation. And then when you have Trump, you know, uh, setting everyone on fire, I mean, like really lighting people up emotionally, you had this impossible combination. That, that hit its fullest expression in 2020. And that's when many of us in the big cities in the Northwest hit the button and said, no, no, thank you. We're out. Um, we're we're going to move to the suburbs. We're going to move to the small towns. We're going to move out of state. Um, and then you have the exodus of the stable, bourgeois, rules-oriented people, entrepreneurs, building owners, real estate developers, not interested anymore. And then you, so you have this really negative cycle of, uh, that that is just I mean destroyed the downtowns that were previously enormously vibrant and and even family friendly to a large extent. Um, you know I, I wouldn't take my kids to some of the neighborhoods in Portland that we used to go to and have a great time. It's an interesting interesting um, observation you're making descriptively 
I think, um, you know, from a modeling model based perspective, I think we need to think of like nonlinear, you know, feedback loops. Like that's what happened, right? It was, it was, as you said, uh, I, I've seen the same thing. Like I go, you know, I come back to the Pacific Northwest all the time, even though I live in Austin. Also, Portland and Austin have a weird relationship. Uh, so uh, everyone in Austin, I'm not everyone, but a lot of people in Austin kind of keep track of what's going on in Portland because people go back and forth yeah. and stuff like that. Um, Austin has had some issues, uh, but uh, it is in a red state. So whenever the city actually goes too far, what happens is the legislature, which meets in the city, will just pass a law uh, and overrule the city. And so there is kind of like a metastable equilibrium there, which unfortunately Portland does not have because Portland calls the shots in the, in the state, like Austin. And so you have, um, you know, this kind of like bidding war, you know, bidding war of, you know, do good leftism, which happened. And now I think they're at an impasse because they don't know how to roll this back. Uh, they don't want to be fascist, you know, they don't want to be pro-Trump because, you know, enforcing regulations is pro-Trump, you know what I'm saying? I mean, basically, yeah. allowing businesses to do their business is pro, it's, yeah. you know, this is, this is really where it's gone. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have been alienated, as you said, and the people that would actually put a stop on this, they're the ones that are exiting. That's the fundamental problem. Yeah. We're left over with the people that have no investment in the current system and that, want it to get worse, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, it's the same dynamic as if you say a uh, kind of developing nation brain drain phenomenon. It's the same exact dynamic. It's like, well, there's corrupt institutions. There's not a lot of opportunity. There is, um, you know, let's say uh, not a vibrant entrepreneurial culture. And so you have, you know, certain developing countries where, where the, 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 the smartest, the most upwardly mobile, the most creative, the most entrepreneurial flee that just feeds into that cycle of, of corruption and, 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 and infrastructure decline, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, it's the same thing, but the other, but the, but the problem for something like Portland is that it's also much easier just to leave the city of Portland and move to Beaverton, uh, than, than it is, you know, for someone in, let's say, you know, Bangladesh to, in, to, to immigrate to, 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 uh, you know, Italy or, or the United States. I mean, you, so you have, um, I, I think is what is a, a another generational problem that we've already seen. I mean, we saw this in the late sixties, you know, in the late sixties, there were riots, there was violence and very affluent people fled a city like Detroit and it never came back. Um, so these are actually more fragile dynamics because of the nonlinear nature of what you're talking about. I mean, if you have a kind of vertical curve of, of exodus of capital and, and professional class people, your city is screwed for a significant period of time. And, you know, some food trucks uh, is not going to be enough to bring them back in the short term. You actually have to have a true uh, renaissance, a true gentrification process, a collapse of rents that make it uh, attractive for young people to, to reenter. But Portland has high rents too. So you're saying, wait a minute, what do I, when I was built in Seattle, I had my family, my oldest son and my middle son actually was born in Seattle. We're living in a, a, a very nice neighborhood. It's, you know, we had a condo, a small condo, but they're, you know, million dollar plus homes, um, you know, expensive condo per square foot. We're crammed in there with four people and two bedrooms. And then there's like people defecating on the streets in front of our building. Some guy lit another guy on fire uh, on the corner where we live. People are rummaging in our, our, our parking garage, you know, once or twice a week. Um, there's mentally ill vagrants you know, screaming at my kids when we're walking to the, to the elementary school and saying the, 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 the price to quality ratio here is so out of whack that either the price has to collapse or the authority has to assert itself and, and solve the disorder problem, neither of which is a very attractive uh, 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 prospect. You know, either politically, like the, the restoration of authority is a politically hard sell uh, and, and the, the collapse of, of prices, let's say rental prices, is a catastrophe economically for a lot of people. And so you find uh, you find this very uncomfortable, you know, signaling, you know, coat of paint, you know, food truck, sweep the camps from one block to the next. They're doing this dance where they're trying to have low cost ways of solving this problem. But the true solutions are high cost. I wasn't willing to fight for it. You know, we took off to the little town and get Carver and we're much better off for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, let's let's finish it out with looping back to um, these are the, the real uh, consequences of some of these ideas that you're talking about. 
but uh you know people like angela davis you know there are other people derek bell uh uh free air like all of their this is this is uh driven by people there are people that lived who had these ideas who exposited these ideas and then the ideas became real and i feel we had a period like let's say bill clinton to obama too you know where the democratic party was kind of a technocratic liberal party and you know they basically were were saying look we gotta we gotta maintain order uh because we gotta have business uh because business is what we tax uh to fund the welfare state like that was like the deal and yeah. it, it was stable. It did work, like what you're describing. You know, these like very liberal cities that were never, ne nevertheless orderly. Something broke down in the second half of the teens of that uh, of that deal. And I think you know one thing that is happening is especially younger millennials uh, that don't they have like no memory of the 1980s and the early 90s uh, where there was still a lot of crime. Uh, they don't understand the consequences of disorder. And so they started um, mining and absorbing uh, this uh, educational stuff. And you know, I know I said that, like, you know, we're going to end. And, like, I do want you to actually talk about let's end with the education stuff because that's really concrete. I think yeah. you, you draw the thread out, and that really has an effect on a lot of people. And it's affected a lot of young minds. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think that the education component is really the heart of the book um, because – uh, the, the public education system is a centralized uh, monopoly over the means of intellectual and moral transmission. Uh, and so if you control the public education, uh, you, you control to a great extent the formation of kids um, in, in their moral, intellectual, and even spiritual life. And so it's a great coup for any political movement to to take control of the curriculum, the training, the accreditation, the administration. And you have a really unapologetic um, uh, uh, seizure, especially in places like Portland, where I outline in very uh, great detail what's happened to education, where they say uh, the public school system is a means of revolutionary training. We want to have left-wing ideologies. We want to train activists. And we want to send them out into the world to change our society uh, according to a uh, kind of neo-Marxist and left-wing racialist uh, vision of the world. Unapologetically, full stop, that's what we're doing. And that's a very powerful, uh, that's a very powerful process. Uh, and, and I think that it, what, what you're saying, it actually is, dovetails precisely um, with this technocratic left. I mean, it, it, again, uh, Clinton, o uh, Bush, and Obama um, – had, you know, uh, no child left behind, race to the top. And of course, the Obama stuff was a little bit more left coded. Common core. Yeah, there's problems with it. I, I oppose it on, you know, federalist grounds, etc. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the general consensus there was, we need to get kids test scores up. Uh, we need to get them reading, we need to get them uh, doing math, we need to get them pursuing STEM. That was a consent technocratic consensus. But for the same reason that I think the left abandoned it on those quality of life issues, they abandoned it also on education. Raising test scores is hard, um, kind of asymptotically leading, kind of con converging towards impossible. Um, that is the recent history of test scores in the United States. 40 years, a tripling of education spending, uh, all sorts of programs cycling in at our institutions, test scores are completely flat. It's very hard to raise test scores. I think you you know know the data and can parse the data in a more sophisticated way than I can, but that's the basic conclusion from my basic trend line reading. Okay, well, if we can't raise test scores and we have these, these apparatuses, can we change ideology? Can we change consciousness? Can we change politics? That's actually comparatively very easy to do. And so I think that they're substituting an a pedagogy of competence. Uh, 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 rather, they're substitu substituting... Uh, the old pedagogy of competence with the pedagogy of revolution. That's satisfactory. It's also easier than trying to raise test scores. And it's more emotionally gratifying. And I think that the left has really abandoned the pursuit of, of quality uh, towards the pursuit of politics. And that's the, 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 the fundamental change that we've seen in recent years. So everything, everything is political. This is uh, 
you know, it's a good, uh, it's a good opportunity for you. It's been, it's been good for you. Uh, this period of history, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> good for Rufo business, you know, uh, if we had a boring technocratic, and what would you be doing, Chris? You know, like, so <laughs> I'd be doing documentaries in China. You know, that's what I, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess, you know, you, uh, your goal uh, should be to get yourself out of business, you know? That's right. Yeah. That's, That's like, right. Yeah. It's like uh, your fellowship renewal, but how? Like, you know, we fixed all this. We, yeah. We, we, to, we got to shut all this stuff, stuff down, right? Move on to something else. Yeah. I, I hope so. I mean, I hope that I can, you know, I, I love doing new things. I, I try to set new projects every year. And uh, and if we resolve some of these issues, which will take time, you know, I would be, you know, the first person to be happy. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm competent and creative and, and, and have, you know, talents and, and, and a good network. And so um, I would be more than happy to, to win the culture war, uh, you know, put down my sword and, and, and go do something else. Uh, you know, that would be, that would be happy for me. All right. Well, so on that optimistic note, um, let's, uh, let's end. Um, and uh, yeah, so I do want to say um, the book is, uh, it's well-written. Uh, I, I did tell you, you're, you're, you're a pretty good, I mean, you're a good writer. Uh, it, it, it pulled me. Um, I actually had it to read. And then I was prompted to read it uh, literally at the end of last week because a friend of mine who is a geneticist uh, got a copy of it um, and uh, said, wow, like uh, this is really well written and I learned a lot of things. And I was like, oh, OK, well, if uh, someone who's, you know, this is someone who's totally out of field, uh, does not know who Saul Walensky or Marcuse or anything is. And they, they really recommended it. So I was like, okay, let's check this out. And, you know, I read it in two sittings. So uh, it's good. Wow. It pulls you along. The narrative is great. Uh, if, if you don't know out there uh, any of this stuff, if this is, if this is Greek to you or uh, Hegelianism, uh, like read the book. Uh, it will, I think, eliminate some things. I think, you know, uh, you might still, people, obviously, you know, people like Richard Hardy, they have different opinions. But, you know, you got to bring it all together, be synoptic. Yeah. And uh, use different lenses. And uh, Chris, uh, you know, for, for for good or bad, I think we will be hearing about you uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, this is a a long march through the culture. It absolutely is. Yeah. All right. Take care, man. Thank you, sir. All right. See you, Rizzi. Whole genome sequencing is used for adults and children every day to assess risk for thousands of diseases. Orchid, a genetics company led by scientists from Stanford, is able to do this for IVF embryos. Now, instead of waiting for a diagnosis, parents can assess if their embryos have genetic variants known to cause severe conditions before their child's even born. No other tests can detect these issues so thoroughly or so early. So check them out at orchidhealth.com. This podcast for kids.